Welcome everybody to the second Young session of the online seminar series, uh, Machine Learning Needs Mathematical Optimization. Uh, today we have the pleasure of having uh, these three speakers. Um, I'm sure that we will learn a lot from their talks. Um, our first speaker is Sinia Kurishenko, who is a PhD student from Copenhagen Business School in Denmark. And today, Sinia is going to tell us about clustering and interpreting via mathematical optimization. The floor is yours, Sinia. Forget. Sorry, yes. Um, I hope you can he hear me and see me, right? Yes, we, we can. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me and uh, for introducing me. So my name is Ksenia, and today I'm going to present for you uh, our joint work with Emilia Corizosa, uh, Alfredo Marin, and Dolores Romero Morales. And here you can see the title, uh, Clustering and Interpreting via Mathematical Optimization. So he is the outline of uh, today's talk, but I'm uh, going to the motivation. So as you know, um, uh, the machine learning methods are really accurate machine learning methods uh, are seen as a black box and uh, with high accuracy, we lose uh, some interpretability of uh, methods, uh, but we actually want to have interpretability in um, decision-making um, models. And there is several well-known um, uh, references. Uh, you have already seen it uh, during last uh, talks. And uh, people want to know what is going on inside the model and want to interpret the results. And I'm going to show you uh, my research in this area. So I'm not going to um, discuss whole uh, interpretability in whole areas, machine learning, but I'm focused on clustering. And uh, we can aim for interpretability in cluster analysis in two ways, uh, post hoc interpretability and joint clustering um, and interpretability. In the first way, uh, we do clustering by our, by any existed uh, method and uh, interpret the results in the second stage. And there is some uh, work done already here. And uh, the second way when we can uh, do clustering and interpretability uh, together inside one model. And there is also some uh, work have already been done. So uh, uh, there is no common term for interpretability. And uh, in our, this presentation, uh, we will uh, understand under interpretability uh, such explanation that uh, for each individual, we will know whether it satisfies or not to the um, explanation. And also we will uh, consider several uh, types of explanations in today's presentation, uh, namely prototype-based and uh, rule-based. And now I'm going to explain a bit more what is that. Uh, so prototype-based explanation. Imagine we have uh, clusters, uh, K clusters and I individuals. So this is the red and blue one. And uh, also we have a set of uh, prototypes, which are the same individuals from these clusters. And our model will tell us who of these uh, candidates to prototype is actually our face of our clusters. So our model will choose these two guys as a representative individuals for whole cluster, red for red cluster and blue for blue cluster. And we call them as prototypes. Uh, in um, rule-based explanations, we have also clusters, uh, individuals, and also features of um, characteristics of our individuals, for example, uh, income and age. And um, instead of having set of uh, prototypes, we have set of basic rules. Uh, such that, for example, age less than 50 or income more than uh, 2,000. And the model has to combine them in, in such uh, explanations 
which are combination of our basic explanation. And now our red cluster is, is explained by this explanation and blue cluster is explained by this uh, explanation. Uh, if you ask me how we choose this um, explanation, I will tell you that we are using um, true positive and false positive uh, con uh, concept, namely uh, if individual i from cluster uh, k, so red individual from red cluster, is explained by uh, red explanation, so belongs to uh, red prototype, then we call it like a true positive case. But if individual uh, belongs to uh, a blue cluster, but explain it by red uh, explanation, then we call it as a false positive case. And the same can be true for uh, rule-based explanations. And uh, the main goal is to maximize uh, true positives and minimize false positives. So uh, let me go to the uh, post hoc interpretability. And as the data, we have uh, dissimilarity measured between each pair of individuals, and uh, also clusters are given. So uh, clusters can come from uh, other clustering procedures. And we purpose two mathematical optimization models here, inspired by uh, classical location analysis problems. So uh, we develop uh, the covering model, and this model finds a prototype and also a radius and um, explain each individual inside of this uh, radius by this prototype. The partition model finds only the prototype and uh, explain uh, individuals by the prototype. So there are uh, two uh, models, uh, main difference of them is that in the founding model we can have individuals speak uh, explained uh, by two explanations prototype on the explanation at all. Uh, in the positioning model we have unique assignment and uh, for example this uh, guy was explained by red prototype because it's closer to red prototype than to blue prototype. And again uh, the closeness uh, we understand in terms of similarity measurement. Okay, here's the public model uh, for relation, and uh, we uh, have uh, in our function function they told you optimization of total number of true positive cases, and uh, we minimize total number of false positive cases. We weighted by uh, theta. Also, we have first, uh, one prototype per cluster, some constraints for uh, choosing radius, and uh, also we have uh, these uh, two important constraints, um, which are telling us that we can control true positive uh, cases and false positive cases in each uh, cluster. So what does it mean? For example, we have uh, uh, clusters and we want for sure to have 80% of true positives and 20% of uh, uh, false positives. Then we can do it by these uh, two constraints. Okay, uh, so the second model was the partitioning model. And again, as before, we the objective function uh, maximizes total uh, true positives and minimizes uh, total false positives by, weighted by um, parameter T theta, also one uh, prototype per cluster, uh, unique assignment, and the same uh, control of uh, uh, true positive cases and four positive cases in each cluster. So the two models are formulated as uh, mixed integer linear programming uh, problems and uh, I will show you the results in the numerical illustration section. So now uh, I want to show you model with rules. As you remember, we used for this model rule-based explanations, and we're still uh, in the post hoc interpretability. So now we are giving uh, a set of uh, basic rules such that uh, we can split them into some groups, for example, features. And there is an example of that. So imagine we have uh, 
some characteristics of our data and uh, we can uh, construct some explanations within each uh, characteristic and this is uh, going to be our basic rules and our explanation uh, which model will uh, do for us is a combination of uh, these basic rules uh, such that we can control the length of these uh, explanations so we can choose at most a basic uh, rules and also we uh, have at most one room from at, at most one rule from each group so uh, for example we have the, the list of uh, basic rules uh, regarding to age and uh, here we'll choose for one cluster or only one exp uh, explanation basic rule from that okay so here is the model uh, and as before we uh, uh, maximize uh, total true positives and minimize total false positive cases uh, weighted by theta but now we have slightly different constraints because we uh, want to choose at most one uh, basic rule uh, by uh, group and also we control the length uh, for example we have 10 features but if we will have a very long explanation uh, it will less interpretable interpretable then it's uh, reasonable reasonable to have here this uh, constraint and it's very important and uh, yeah some um, other constraints so this model uh, contains only uh, interpretability measures inside here, uh, which means that we are not doing clustering here. But this model we can um, adjust and insert here clustering. And I will show you how we can do this. So now I want to show you joint clustering and interpretability. And uh, just for, to remind you, now we don't have clusters, so we will decide it in the model. Uh, but still, we have the similarity between uh, each pair of individuals. And voila, here we add uh, additional term, inter-homogeneity uh, term. And also, we have to add several uh, uh, such constraints and terms here. So now we uh, minimize our inter-homogeneity uh, and still maximize uh, total true positive and minimize uh, total false positive cases. And as you can see, because X is our uh, decision variables uh, as uh, sigma, uh, here we have product of two variables and we can uh, linearize this product uh, in a very uh, clever way such that so we introduce some uh, new variables and add uh, some, um, change our constraints but now we have uh, linearity here but still we have a uh, product of two decision variables here and we can uh, linearize it by for that transformation so um, this model uh, can do uh, clustering and interpretability uh, at the same time because we have uh, these three terms in our objective function. Uh, but clustering term is very hard to solve uh, because we consider each pair of individuals. And uh, we, I will show you in the result, uh, numerical section how we do this, uh, this problem. OK, so now I wanted to show you some uh, numerical illustrations. And first, I will start with uh, this model, this prototype. And here's our real life data. This is Canadian climate data. Uh, so our data is these 35 uh, curves of uh, annual temperatures and uh, we can see that the distance between two um, curves as uh, Euclidean norm between two uh, vectors um, and uh, also this data we can see by different uh, color uh, groups in four clusters and uh, now uh, we want to choose our prototype. So the covering model gives us uh, these prototypes and uh, here the uh, quality. Quality, I mean, um, how many uh, total true positives and false positive cases per cluster we have with these chosen explanations and there's uh, that quality. And uh, here we can have uh, the perfect clusters, which means that we have 100% of uh, true positives and uh, 
0% of false positives, which is good. The partitioning model uh, gives us a slightly different result, but still uh, the quality is good. And the second uh, numerical illustration is about simulated data. We want to show the scalability of our model. As you can see, our original data is uh, three clusters in uh, their two uh, dimension, and uh, the size of that is um, uh, up to one million. But of course, we can't uh, solve it uh, directly. We do sampling. So we uh, select uniformly some individuals and some candidates to prototype, and then evaluate obtained quality on the original data set. And here, the, that quality. So total true positives, uh, no, but uh, true positive cases, false positive uh, cases for sample data. It's what we obtain uh, when we optimize the model. And this is the evaluated quality on our original data. And as you can see, I color by blue, uh, which uh, slightly uh, worse than uh, a re sampled uh, result. But the difference is just 2%. So it's uh, really close to the sampled quality. And there is also several cases when the obtained quality is even better than um, obtain it on sample data set. So uh, actually we can uh, scale our um, um, data and we can handle large instances. Okay, so now I want to move to model this result, uh, with rules. And as you remember, I told you this model can be uh, considered for post hoc interpretability and for joint interpretability. And we are using here housing data, which is for use for regression. Uh, but we will uh, ignore uh, response variables when we do clustering. And when we have to have given clusters, we will use this uh, variable uh, to construct uh, clusters by uh, considering different quantiles of this uh, variable, response variable. And as explanations, uh, rule, uh, I mean, basic explanations, we construct uh, such uh, rules as here, uh, where each threshold for numerical variables is uh, different values of quantiles for these features. Okay. And here the result for post hoc interpretability. So we consider several uh, number of clusters uh, with uh, different lengths. Uh, so when we consider uh, uh, short length, uh, namely one, so it means that we choose only a basic rule. We can see that we um, obtain not so high quality, but it's uh, uh, expected and. Uh, quality mean in terms of true positive rate. And also here the false positive rate, and that's also sometimes not good, especially for uh, when we have um, length one. But this is uh, the quality which we can obtain uh, when we have a given cluster. Uh, let me show you the results when we do simultaneous clustering and interpretation. So. Uh, again, because uh, the data is uh, quite large for uh, clustering, um, because um, it's hard to solve. So we also do sampling as we did for uh, prototype model. And uh, here are the results for original data set. And as you can see now, our uh, explanations are almost Senior. perfect. Uh, yeah. You have one minute. Yeah, thank you. So uh, yes, uh, so this is, uh, we can see difference with previous results. We, here, we, when we do clustering, we can adjust clusters uh, in order to have uh, better explanation. And it's shown here. Okay, so it was my results for the model with rules. And uh, I introduced um, several models uh, with uh, prototype-based uh, explanations and with rules-based explanations where for rule-based explanations, we can do clustering simultaneously with um, interpretability. And for future line, we would like to change our model's formulation and uh, provide some math heuristic to do with large-scale instances in the second uh, model. And yeah, uh, our first model, this prototype, is already on uh, research gate, uh, and the second model, model will uh, is coming soon. 
So thank you for your attention. And uh, yeah, I am. Thank you, Sinian, for your nice presentation. Uh, we will move uh, the question till the end of the session. Okay. So uh, our next speaker is Benedetto Manca. He's a postdoctoral researcher from the Univers Università di Cagliari in Italy, and he's going to talk about binary classification via ellipsoidal separation. The floor okay, is yours. Thank you so much. I hope you can see the slides and uh, hear me, hopefully. Yes, we can. Yes, perfect. Okay, so I'm Benedetto Manca from the University of Cagliari, and thanks for the introduction and for inviting me at this uh, seminar. So today I will talk about a joint talk with uh, Annabella Storino, Enrico Gorgone, and Antonio Frungioni about uh, binary classification via ellipsoidal separation. So I will introduce uh, two different uh, definitions of uh, ellipsoidal separation, and then I will define uh, two uh, uh, binary classifiers based on those uh, definitions. So I'll start with the first one. So we consider two finite uh, point sets in Rn and uh, an ellipsoid S. And we say that uh, S separates A and B if uh, every point of A is uh, inside the interior of the ellipsoid S, and every point of uh, the set B is left outside of the ellipsoid. So this picture shows uh, the situation we are uh, considering. So what we want to do is to find the oops, minimum volume ellipsoid S, which uh, separates A and B according to the definition I just uh, gave you. So to do that, we consider the points of A and B as uh, labeled points. So label minus one corresponds to the sets A and label plus one corresponds to the set uh, B. And we started considering the standard uh, SUM uh, model with quadratic kernel. So uh, we started with this model where the map uh, phi is the quadratic kernel map, which map the point from the, in, from the space Rn to an higher dimensional space. So why we do that, uh, it's because the kernel trick basically consists uh, in mapping uh, the point from uh, the input space where the points uh, are not linearly separable. And uh, the map maps the point in, into an higher dimensional space where it is possible to find a separating hyperplane. And so this is more or less the situation represent, uh, graphically represented. And in the case where uh, the map phi is the quadratic kernel map, we have that the pre-image of the separating hyperplane in the feature space is a quadratic surface. But uh, as it is, uh, we don't have any condition uh, on the surface. And so it can be any quadratic surface, so paraboloid, ellipsoid, or uh, hyperboloid. So what we wanted to do is, was to force the structure of the separating surface in the input space to be an ellipsoid. And in order to do that, uh, we consider the symmetric matrix uh, W, which is constructed uh, from the ve variable vector W in the quadratic SF1 model. And we observe that uh, the expression phi x uh, scalar W is equivalent to this expression uh, with the matrix W which represent a quadratic uh, uh, surface in the input space, which is an ellipsoid if and only if the matrix W is uh, semi-definite positive. Therefore, if we add the constraint W semi-definite semi positive to the previous model, we obtain exactly the model we want to solve in order to find an ellipsoid which contains the point of A and not con uh, does not contain any point of B. So from this model, then we, uh, we uh, adjust it a little bit because we had uh, the term log that of W in the objective function with, which models the volume of the ellipsoid and the term uh, Frobenius norm of W, which prevents the ellipsoid to be degenerate, which means that it prevents the ellipsoid to have semi-axes which are uh, too close to zero. And uh, finally, we add the slack variables uh, xi i for every point because we want to find the solution uh, even if the, the two sets uh, are not uh, perfectly separable uh, with an ellipsoid. 
So uh, once we solve this problem, which is possible to solve because it's just an SDP pro uh, problem, with a, we we can define our uh, classification criterion, in which in this case is just the trivial one. So once we have the ellipsoid S, we say that the point X of R n is uh, classified as a point of A if it's inside the interior of the ellipsoid, and it is classified as a point of B if it's left outside of the uh, ellipsoid S. So after this, we started to run some tests on normal data set taken from the lib SVM uh, library. But as you can see, the results are uh, far from being good, both from the time because our uh, program is super slow and also the solution, the accuracy of the classifier is not, uh, uh, is not better, for example, than quadratic SVM, which is our first uh, comparison because we derived our model from quadratic SVM. So uh, we, we, didn't, we stopped focusing on this uh, normal data set, let's say, but we realized that it is possible to apply our classifier to the, to the problem of edge detection in, in pictures. In fact, we run just uh, only few experiments, so it's still, uh, we still want to investigate a bit more of this application, but we think it is promising because, for example, in this case, our model found, uh, finds a better solution than the uh, quadratic SVM model. So clearly, we have to compare our model with other uh, edge detection program, clearly. But it was already curious that uh, it is possible to obtain a better solution than the quadratic uh, SVM. For example, I also visually, we can tell that uh, in here, the edge are better than here because they are not continuous. So as quadratic as one can't find uh, a full line here or in general, every line. I also, and this is another example. But yes, as I said, we still need to investigate. Maybe we can improve our uh, result in this problem, but we think maybe this is the right application for the classifier we we found. So now I move to the other uh, definition of uh, ellipsoidal separation. So now we consider two convex sets in Rn and an ellipsoid. And now we say that uh, the ellipsoid S separates A and B if S intersects every segment connecting points of A and points of B. So now this picture shows the situation we are uh, considering. So we want the ellipsoid basically in between the two sets. So as before, we want to find the minimum volume ellipsoid uh, which separates uh, A or B. And uh, uh, in this case, we consider A and B uh, given by the convex all of two finite point sets. And uh, uh, if we denote with uh, I and J the index sets, the program we want to solve is the following, where so we want to minimize the volume of the ellipsoid, where the second and third constraint is just uh, mean that uh, the points of A and points of B are left outside of the ellipsoid. And the first constraint is telling us that we want at least one point of the convex combination of AI and BJ to sit inside of the ellipsoid S. So as you can see, this program, it's uh, difficult to solve because it is linear. Since we are uh, multiplying the variable S with gamma, which is another variable representing the center of the ellipsoid, and we're also multiplying S by Xj, which depends on the variable alpha Ij. So we started to reformulate the problem in order to be able to solve it. And the first thing we did was to get rid of the center of the variable gamma, uh, which represents the center of the ellipsoid. And to do that, uh, we use the fact that uh, every ellipsoid uh, in Rn can be considered as the intersection of an ellipsoid in Rn plus one centered in the origin, intersected with an appropriate hyperplane. If once we have uh, the matrix uh, G representing the ellipsoid in Rn plus one, if we decompose the uh, matrix G as followed, uh, as shown in the slide, and we compute the quantities gamma and delta, we have the, the following fact also, which means that the point one X in Rn plus one belong to the ellipsoid G, if and only if the point X in Rn belong to the ellipsoid S gamma in Rn, 
where S is derived from the uh, components of the matrix G. Therefore, we can replace the variable S and gamma with the variable G, and we don't have to deal with the multiplication of S and gamma anymore, because we only have G, uh, G is an ellipsoid centered in the origin. Then the second thing we did was to model the volume of the ellipsoid S in a different way. And uh, in order to do that, we considered this quantity B of S, the box size of the ellipsoid S, which re is represented by in the, by the picture, which can be used as a measure of the volume of the ellipsoid, as you can see from the picture. And it is possible to represent this quantity using this uh, uh, SDP constraint, which implies that the trace of the auxiliary variable T is greater or equal than the box size of the ellipsoid S squared. And since the inverse of S is uh, a feasible solution of this constraint, and it is the optimal value of this uh, small program, we can uh, model the volume of the ellipsoid by adding in the objective function the trace of uh, the variable t and adding the SDP constraint uh, showed in the slide. So if we put everything together, we obtain the final model that we want to solve, where we just uh, add the slack variables uh, beta, v, and w in order to be able to obtain always a solution, even if the two sets are not uh, uh, perfectly separable. And then we add uh, the Frobenius norm of f in the objective function, which similar to the other approach is uh, um, preventing the ellipsoid to be degenerate. So this is the final model. Still, this was a bit difficult to solve, but we realized that uh, if uh, we fixed the variable alpha, the program reduces to an SDP program. And uh, on the other side, uh, on the other end, if we fix the variable G, it, uh, the program reduces to a quadratically constrained program. Therefore, we thought about using a block gauss adel approach in order to solve uh, the program, which uh, iteratively uh, solve uh, the SDP program in uh, the variable G. And once a solution of this is obtained, we solve the quadratically constrained program in alpha, where G, uh, G bar is the solution of the previous uh, program. So this is, yes, this is just the scheme of the algorithm we used. So we first start with the randomly generated values of alpha. We initially uh, solved the, the SDP program to in order to have an initial ellipsoid. And then we iteratively solve uh, the quadratic constraint program and then the SDP program to use the relative decrement of the objective value, function value is less than a certain threshold that uh, we chose. So, okay, this is just the algorithm. And just to show you how the algorithm works, here you can see we have two sets of points, the blue one and the red point, uh, and the red points, so A and B. And the green points represent the point XEJ at the first iteration. So, as you can see, when the algorithm starts, the green points start to align into a line because in this case, the two sets are linearly separable. And the ellipsoid shrinks into uh, in a way that it contains all the green points, but none of the green, of the red or blue points, because in this case we didn't use any regularizing term. So in this case the ellipsoid can degenerate into a line. But what happens when the two points are not linearly separable? And here we can see that uh, yes, we see these four points are uh, makes the two sets not linearly separable. In this case, we see that uh, the ellipsoid starts to shrink, but instead of continuing to shrink indefinitely, it decides that it is better to keep uh, these uh, two points, and therefore these two points inside of the ellipsoid, and not uh, uh, misclassify them uh, completely, because if these points will be on this side of the ellipsoid, it will be uh, definitely misclassified. So at least this shows us that the algorithm is doing something quite smart, at least even in these cases. So once we solve this program uh, and found the ellipsoid, we can define the classification criterion. And uh, so given a, a new point Z of Rn, we first say that uh, Z is separated from A with respect to the ellipsoid S if uh, S intersects every segment connecting point, uh, the point Z with points of A. 
and uh, uh, S intersect only some of the segments connecting Z with point of B, and vice versa, Z is separated from B. And then we say that Z is classified as a point of A if it's separating from B with respect to the ellipsoid S, vice versa, Z is classified as a point of B if it is separated from A. The only problem or thing is that uh, many points, for example, for example, every point inside of the ellipsoid S cannot be classified because they are neither separated from A nor from B. And thus we introduced a third class uh, in the classification process, which is the class of uh, undetermined or uh, rejected points. So, uh, okay, so this is just how we compute the classification criteria. We just computed the number uh, of segment, segments which connect Z with points of uh, A minus S, analogously for uh, B, uh, the, point, the segments connecting Z with points of B minus S, and then the classification score is defined as uh, RA of Z and RB of Z, which is just a minus uh, RA of Z, which is given by this uh, expression. And then we say that uh, if RA of Z is close to one, then Z is uh, classified as a point of A with a certain degree of uh, certainty. And vice versa, if uh, RB of Z is close to one, then uh, Z is likely to belong to, to B. And uh, for the third class, we have that uh, if RA of Z induce RB of Z is zero, then Z is a rejected point. So we are, the classifier is not able to classify it as a point of A or B. So the, the fact is that we have this uh, rejection zone, so the rejected points in the classification process, implies that we have to consider in, when computing the accuracy of the classifier, because we don't want the classifier to reject uh, too many points or every point and uh, uh, not be able to try anything. So what we did was to, for example, if we have a set of points that we want to uh, compute the accuracy for our classifier, so we know if these points are uh, points of A or points of B, according to a certain label, then our classifier uh, assigns uh, a label which can be minus, uh, minus one plus one or zero, because the point can be classified as a point of A, classified as a point of B or rejected. And then when computing accuracy, also in the training phase for the classifier, we, uh, we say that every time you reject a point, so every time you assign the label zero, you pay something, which is a fraction of the number of uh, samples, where psi is a constant uh, chosen a priori, which can be uh, a number in the, in the interval uh, zero, one uh, half. So in this way, the classifier should learn that uh, it's not convenient to reject too many points, if it's possible. Uh, so for this approach, really I don't have any um, results because it's uh, super slow even for small instances. So what we are doing now in order to obtain some uh, results is to improving the, the speed of the algorithm. And we're thinking about using a column generation type uh, heuristic. So we, the idea is just to consider only a subset of point X, J, start to solve the series specific program, and then update the variable alpha J for every I and J using the, this, uh, ellip the first ellipsoid. And then trying to find a criterion that says that uh, some, po some point XEJ will not contribute uh, uh, in improving the next solution of the STP, the next STP program, and then iterate this process until we consider every point XEJ where we discard every point which is not uh, relevant, let's say, in the improving of the, of the solution. So for now, we are working on this. And uh, yes. I think I'm done. Thanks for the attention. Great, Benedetto. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I will ask for, to the audience that they save uh, their question till the end of the session. And now it's time for our last speaker, Marco Morucci. He's a PhD student from Duke University in the USA. And Marco will talk us about uh, adaptive hyperbox matching for interpretable treatment effect estimation. Marco? 
All right. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, yeah, and today I'm going to be telling you about my work uh, on uh, treatment effect estimation. This is joint work with Cynthia Rudy, Sudipa Roy, uh, Alexander Volfoski, and Victoria Orlandi. More on that at the end. Uh, but let's dive right into it. So, uh, why causal inference? Um, well, so causal estimates are increasingly used to justify high stakes decisions virtually in all sectors. And um, so it, it is important that we provide decision makers with uh, models that uh, give them trustworthy um, estimates, but that are also interpretable and justifiable in terms of humanly readable decision rules. Um, so this is sort of a, a theoretical summary of the treatment effect estimation problem for those who are familiar with it. In practice, uh, we have a set of N experimental units, um, and there is a treatment T uh, that is either assigned or not assigned to uh, some of these units. So TI is going to be 1 when a unit I receives the treatment, and it's going to be 0 when it doesn't. Um, and so the idea here is that we're only going to observe the state that they're in when they receive the treatment. So uh, we're ever only going to see unit I either with the treatments or without the treatments, but never with both. But really what we're interested in is what would happen if we didn't treat unit I. Um, and so the problem of causal inference is sort of the problem of uh, solving this unobserved quantity um, estimation problem. Um, more practically, without sort of delving on theory too much, um, here is what we would like to do. So consider unit A here in the figure to the right. Um, it's a male uh, with a certain set of, you know, age, height, and weight, um, and we give a treatment to A. As I just said, what we would like to know is what would happen to A if he didn't receive the treatment. Now, the main idea behind matching is that we would like to compare A to its identical twin who didn't receive the tre treatment. So again, the figure here, this is B, right? Um, but the problem is, you know, very few people have identical twins that we can observe. And so, um, and so uh, uh, we never really observe B. So what's the best that we can do? Well, the best that we can do is, is scour our data set for someone who didn't receive the treatment, but is close enough to A in terms of these features that we observe. And so here in the feature, in, in the figure, uh, this is going to be C. And so matching, uh, very simply, is the problem of identifying everyone's most similar unit who received a different treatment uh, than the one that they got. Um, so why would we do this? Um, matching is but one way of uh, estimating treatment effects of the treatment on an outcome. Um, but I would like to argue that matching is a desirable way of, of sort of figuring out what the effect of these treatments are because it's interpretable. Um, and it permits greater accountability uh, in high stakes settings. So for example, a policymaker that wants to figure out if uh, some sort of uh, education policy is having a good effect on um, test score results in schools uh, can uh, should be able to explain how the number, uh, this difference in test scores that they got uh, was obtained in the first place. Um, and um, interpretability has all sorts of other nice features, um, including trustworthiness. Um, and the main, the main idea here is that matching is interpretable because the estimates that it produces are case-based, right? Uh, you can say to a decision maker that you came up with this number for the effect of the treatment uh, because you looked at similar cases. Uh, you, you can point to where in the data you got your uh, estimate from. Um, so this is nice, but the problem that arises is what do you do when you have continuous covariates? So continuous covariates, right, in a probabilistic setting, it, the probability that you're going to find units that have exactly the same value of a covariate is very low. Um, and so how do you then know who to match with whom? 
A uh, seemingly natural solution here is to coarsen in continuous variables, to bend them, um, and to then form groups of units that are mashed together uh, based on these bends that we're made, making. Um, however, how do we know how much should we coarsen in each variable? This is, I would say, a pretty natural question that arises in the setting. Um, so how do we go about that? Well, consider this setting here, right? So what we see in the, in the figure to the left is a variable x that we would like to course in on the, on the bottom axis. And here's y, which is the treatment outcome uh, uh, on, the, on the top axis. This black solid line here is the, uh, f the, the relationship between x and y. Um, and so ideally, um, what you would want is you would want to match together that are close, uh, both in terms of x, but also in terms of f of x. Um, what happens when you just pick a, a length, a size of a box, and then just sort of match everyone in the same box? Well, you get these problems here, um, such as the one to the left, where unit one and unit two are matched together because they're close in terms of x. But in this uh, area of the x space, uh, the value, the function, the, the sort of value of y uh, uh, in relationship to x va varies very quickly. And so these two units should not be matched together. But you also get the opposite problem in the uh, further to the right area of the x space because now you have units that are further away in terms of x. Uh, but in this part of the covariate space, y varies very little. And so you can match them together and you're going to get people that look similar in terms of uh, outcomes. So ideally, what you would want to do is something like what's in the figure to the right. You would want to make your coarsenings or boxes adaptively to uh, the outcome function that you're interested in. So if you look here to the left, um, now we're making boxes that are very close together whenever y varies very quickly. And instead to the right of this figure, we're making boxes that are uh, wider and further apart whenever y varies slowly. And we're sort of uh, avoiding these issues. Um, cool. So then uh, what are our takeaways from this is that the relationship between x and y, uh, where again, x is the covariates that we're matching on and y is the outcome that we're interested in, should be considered uh, when, when making these boxes or bins. Um, and even so, um, you could think that there could be an optimal width uh, that, that sort of takes both into account, but the, the fact that this is fixed across the whole covariate space is just not enough because different parts of the covariate space uh, should be bent according to the variance of y. All right. Um, and so um, in this paper that this talk is based on, uh, we uh, uh, want to solve precisely this problem uh, by learning the optimal coarseness of this continuous data um, that satisfy the criteria that I just told you all about. So how does the algorithm that we propose work? So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to divide our data into two different sets. There's going to be a training set and there's going to be a test, a matching set. Ideally, the, the training set is a smaller subset of the matching set, and the matching set contains all the units that we would like to estimate uh, um, treatment effects for. Um, so on this training set, we're going to fit a flexible machine learning model to predict uh, potential outcomes for each unit in the matching set. So again, for each unit in the matching set, we're going to use the training set data to predict what would happen if it got the treatment, which here is denoted by y1, and what would happen if it didn't, which is denoted by y0. We're going to create a nice little table with all our matching units and these predictions in it. Um, and again, this can be done with your favorite machine learning tool. It can be a black box. It can be whatever you want. Step number two, we're going to take all our matching units and construct a p-dimensional box where p is the number of features that we have um, according to these rules. Number one, there need to be as many units as possible in the box. Number two, the predicted outcomes from the previous stage need to be similar among units that are in the box. And number three, um, the predictions that we get by averaging observed outcomes of units in the box need to be similar to the predictions that the machine learning model makes for the same units. 
And so as you can see that as, as we add units, sort of our, our potential box that we're making kind of restricts itself and it gets to this optimal shape. Once we found uh, an optimal box the way I just described, we just match together the units that are in it. And that's it. This is uh, very briefly the algorithm that we have envisioned for this. Um, formally, uh, the problem that we solve uh, can be stated uh, in a very general way, uh, like in this equation. Um, where essentially we want to minimize, we want to find a box that minimize uh, outcome prediction error, it minimize variances of outcome in the box, and it maximizes number of points uh, within each box. In practice, this is uh, the uh, objective function that we uh, employ in our uh, in our implementation. And these f hats here are the predictions made at stage one by the uh, machine learning algorithm uh, on the units in the matching set. Um, and so as you can see, we're sort of trying to uh, make the distance between predicted outcomes uh, for all treatments uh, of units in the same box as small as possible. And then on the right hand on the right hand side of this minus sign, there is a term that controls how many units are in the box uh, so that we can maximize that number. Um, so the good news is uh, that this uh, problem that I just showed you uh, can be turned pretty easily into a, a mixed integer linear problem uh, by adding a few constraints and shifting a couple of things around that I'm not going to show you in detail, but it can be done. And then you can just plug it into your favorite MIP solver um, and get a solution um, and get a solution from that. Um, yet another good news is that uh, you can pre-process this program in, in some simple ways to make uh, the optimizer work uh, quite fast. Um, and so you can get a solution for a moderately sizable data set in a, a workable amount of time. However, uh, in our paper, we also propose a uh, approximate algorithm that is uh, much, much faster. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into too much detail on how this algorithm works, but suffice to say that uh, the algorithm uh, works somewhat greedily by um, essentially doing a uh, uh, direction-wise expansion for the box. So suppose that you have a unit that you want to match. Uh, you're going to consider each covariate on its own terms, and you're going to uh, you're going to expand the box along. Um, the covariate or direction with the lowest predicted outcome variance. And then you're just going to repeat and slowly grow this box until a desired threshold um, is met. Um, and in practice, empirically, we find that this solutions output by this model um, get pretty close to what a MIP solver would output in a much longer time span. Um, OK, let me give you a sense of how this performs empirically. So we took this uh, data set, the Lalonde data set, which is uh, a benchmark data set in causal inference matching uh, application. The idea is the data set of the data set is that it comes with both a randomized experiment, which is the golden standard for estimating the effects of the treatment on an outcome, um, and uh, other uh, subsamples of data sets that are not from an experiment that you just match units to. And so you, the idea here is that we know what the true treatment effect uh, that we should uh, be getting is from the experiment, and we're trying to get as close to it as possible by matching. We have around uh, 185 units that we need to find matches for, and we have upwards of like 15,000 units that we can choose from. We match on things like age, education, prior income, race, marital status. And the question that we want to answer in this data set is, what is the effect of a job training program on income after the training program? So does going into the training program actually lead you to better employment opportunities down the line? OK, let me show you what happens in practice with this. So um, again, remember, we have an experimental benchmark, and we want to get as close as possible to it with our estimate. Um, we have two potential samples that we can choose our matches from, CPS and PSID. 
Um, and so the experimental estimate is uh, uh, 1,794 US dollars. Uh, and we want to get as close as possible to this. So here are a bunch of existing matching methods. And this is uh, the S these are the estimates that they output. Uh, so sort of a naive uh, method goes completely uh, haywire, gets nowhere near close. Something like prognostic score matching um, gets pretty close, actually. It's, it's not too, too bad, though there is some variance. Uh, but AHB is actually the method that gets the closest by far uh, in this example. As you can see, we're, we're off by at worst $60, roughly. Um, and so that's that's uh, what I think is a pretty good sign empirically that this is working well in this benchmark data set. Let me give you another intuition for why uh, we are uh, uh, happy with the empirical results that we're getting. Uh, recall that I, that I told you that ideally adaptive bins would look something like what's in the figure. Uh, that I'm showing you here. And these are the bins that AHB outputs on the data from Lalonde. Um, and so just by looking at this figure, I can see that this is pretty close to what we were trying to achieve theoretically. Um, and so it's, it's telling me that we're moving at least in the right direction towards solving the problem that we want to solve. A couple more things. I started by telling you that I like matching because it's interpretable, and our matches are particularly in, uh, interpretable. Here I'm showing you uh, matches made with a different method, propensity score matches, versus our method. So this is the unit that we want to match. So this is a 22-year-old, uh, white, unmarried, no high school degree person with no income. Uh, and these are the matches that we find by matching with prognostic score matching, which again is a benchmark sort of uh, existing matching method. In orange, you see all the covariate values uh, of units that are matched to it that are just very different from the treated units that we want to match to. Uh, maybe the treatment effect that we get out of this group is close to the one that we would like from the experiment, but in practice, we match to units that are quite different. We don't really know how to interpret these units that are matched to uh, our treated unit. With AHB, instead, you, uh, we find that we match units that are pretty similar to the treated unit uh, that we started with. And so this match group you know, is very interpretable. I feel like at a, at a, even by a non-expert, you can just look at it and see that you are comparing people that are similar uh, in terms of the covariance. Let me give you one more example of interpretability. AHB permits you to create uh, interactive outputs that kind of look like this. So this is a simulated data set in which there are two covariates, x1 and x2. Um, and I'm going to show you uh, the boxes that our method creates for each unit. So as you can see, you can sort of hover on the unit, and it'll tell you um, the estimated uh, treatment effect. Uh, but it also will show you the box that the algorithm found for that unit. And so you can visually debug your data pretty easily, right? You can look at this unit and say, well, this unit got an IT of, got a treatment effect estimate of 0 0.06 because it was matched to these other units here. And you can also go in and look at the boxes made for those units. You can have visual sort of confirmations of your assumptions by looking at, uh, you know, where the data is denser, boxes are indeed smaller. Where the data is sparser, boxes are indeed larger. Um, and so, you, again, I, I think that this is very easy to interpret visually. Let me conclude by pointing you to our website. This is the Most Matching Exactly Lab. Um, I want to point out two things. Number one, if you go on it, you will see pictures of all my wonderful collaborators that have worked with me on this project. Um, and if you go on our software page, there will be uh, links to R and Python packages that implement all our software that I've described during this talk. Um, and if you think it can be useful to you, I encourage you to download it and play with it and send us an email if you think there are bugs or stuff that you like or you don't like. Um, but yeah, so that's pretty much it. In conclusion, I hope to have argued that interpretability of causal estimates is indeed important. Um, and I hope that I have uh, showed you that we have, um, that we can indeed use machine learning to produce interpretable and accurate uh, matching, uh, treatment effects via matching. Um, and that our estimates are very richly explainable in terms of both of cases and in terms of covariate similarity. And uh, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, I am very happy to take them.
Thank you, Marco, for your nice talk. Now we have um, a time for for questions to any of the speakers. So feel free to to unmute yourself or uh, raise your hand or type your question on the chat. <laughs> Daniel Alois, uh, would you like to state your question? Yeah, hello. Uh, thanks for the talk and for the series of seminars. I'm uh, I'm in Canada, so it's really interesting to to meet you people here from such long distance. I have a question for Xenia uh presentation yeah uh maybe maybe i i lost something but uh, uh from what i understood you use uh, the labels in the objective function in your mathematical optimization model and uh, i was curious about that maybe i missed some part but usually when you use clustering it's in the case in which we don't have label data so usually when you have label data, you go toward uh, supervised methods like decision trees, SVMs, neural networks. So my question is more in the sense of uh, regarding the main motivation for using this type of models that uh, also include the, the true labels, I mean, the uh, the true negatives, true positives, and things, and, and, and the variants into the model in order to to use it in in, in real. Yeah, uh, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, I apologize yeah. for uh, some uh, problems with my headphones. And yes, um, good question. Um, and as I uh, told, uh, there is uh, two ways. Uh, actually, we can uh, interpret given clusters and why it's also important. Uh, uh, because uh, clustering uh, is something when um, we have a lot of um, different models of clustering. Uh, and usually what clustering does is just to um, minimize uh, uh, within uh, distances of clusters or working with density. So actually clustering procedures themselves are not interpretable. Uh, and uh, it also has some sense to interpret even results of uh, clustering procedures because actually there is a, is a simple example. We can, of course, uh, do clustering and then, um, I don't know, apply decision trees on the label by clustering procedure data, but there is uh, other options. And in my case, uh, with prototype optimization, um, sometimes we want to have a representative individual, and this is why we suggest uh, these models. And in terms of clustering, uh, cluster analysis, uh, we can't interpret it so easy. So even post hoc methods are useful. So this is my point why it's important. <laughs> no. Okay, well, I, I I would have more questions and maybe we can discuss by email. I, uh, yeah. I, I suppose you also have other questions from other uh, other people in the on the in the audience. But uh, well, I'm gonna write to you and we can uh, maybe extend the discussion. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there more questions? Could I uh, ask um, uh, Marco? <laughs> so, uh, when you showed your uh, method, uh, I saw the um, you use notation of f function when you do this uh, graph, and um, but actually when you do your algorithm, you are not using this uh, f function. Uh, at all, right? So you use the rules instead of F uh, function. And my question is, how do you think, is it possible to use this um, information about this F function to also construct this uh, matching uh, 
prestige or something like that? Yeah, no, that's a that's an excellent question. So, so the the, and I apologize for sort of the being overly notational there. Uh, it's it's an F instead of a Y because it's the expected Y. Uh, but anyways, but anyways, our idea is that we want to construct rules that take uh, the relationship between X and Y that's defined by F into account, right? And so in parts of the X space where F is very steep, right, where it varies very quickly, you're going to want to make rules that give you very, very tight uh, intervals, right? Because you, you do... Right, you do essentially want to be able to uh, account for that variation. In the ideal, ideal no error world, F would just be stepwise, right? Um, so that literally a box captures all of that variation. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for asking. Thank you. Do we have more questions from the audience? May I ask <laughs> my second question to uh, Benedita? So um, I uh, understood your idea for uh, using ellipse uh, for um, kernel function in first paper, but uh, I um, I don't know what um, in second paper. Why do you want to separate uh, two classes by ellipse? So it's not by uh, plane. What is the advantage of uh, using ellipse? Could you? Explain? Okay, good, good question. Good point. Very good point. So no, our idea is that uh, the introduction of the rejected uh, zone is quite important because we think that uh, if the classifier is able to to be very accurate uh, for the points uh, left outside of the ellipsoid and is able to to tell us. Uh, Okay, look, for this point, I really don't know what to say. So prefer to reject the point instead of misclassify it. It might be a, a kind of, there might be some application for this uh, kind of behavior of the classifier. For example, for, uh, this is just an idea. We don't know if it works, but for a finance uh, data set. It is good if your classifier says, uh, I'm super sure that this will go uh, bad or will go good, so you can invest in it. But on other points, maybe he's able to say, no, okay, I can't say anything about this point, so I won't say anything, so don't risk it. But when it's, it's classifying a point, maybe it's a good, uh, lot accurate. So you can trust him when he's uh, classifying a point, but at least he's able to say, no, look, at this point, I don't know, so I'm, I don't risk it and I'm not classifying so, because of, probably I will be wrong. So this, this was the idea to use uh, a convex set to separate the other two convex sets so that we have uh, some point inside that are uh, rejected, let's say, and they are not uh, misclassified. Thank you. Thank you. Now Thank I you well. Thanks for the question. Yes. Thank you. We have time for another question. Okay, so if we don't have more questions, uh, it's time to to say big thanks to our three speakers and the three wonderful presentation, and also uh, thanks to the audience. Um, see you next week. I recall you that uh, we have Professor uh, Galish Mueli. Uh, but the time it will be different. It will be at 10 a.m. Okay, so keep in mind. <laughs> See you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.